Shalom and welcome back to the Reboot the Root series teachings on salvation. This series is called The Day We Died and this is episode four. I want to thank you for watching the previous episodes in this series and hope that you'll watch the remaining episodes of this exciting series learning about God's salvation for all mankind. Um, in Genesis 2-7, we're going to uh, look at some scriptures that are going to, uh, we're going to take apart and look at who the man is. We already looked at who the woman was. Now we're going to look at the man. In Genesis 2-7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so we know that is the nefesh, um, uh, the he became the nefesh. He became a living soul. And so the breath of God, we know, is the, is the ruach. Um, and um, the ruach of God. <clears throat> and, he, and because God breathed into man, he, he became a living soul. So we look at some words here in this, script, in this, set, this selected scripture. Um, looking at he Hebraic words and terminology. First of all, uh, we have it says, "And Yahweh, the Lord God, formed man." And so, the Hebrew word for man is ish. And then, um, of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so, life in Hebrew means um, haim. And, um, and because he had the breath of life, he, he got it because he had the Ruach or the Spirit of God breathed into him. And it was only by this Ruach, the Spirit of God, that animated or brought man to be a living soul. And so there's this other Hebrew word that talks about the breath of life, which means neshema, neshema. Uh, or neshama, uh, the breath that was gave life to the man, and the man's name was called Adam. He had a name, and we have to understand that all the generations that exist today come from Adam and Eve. Um, we all we all can trace our 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 genealogy back to Noah because um, all of the all the people came from all the earth of the people that came out from the flood came from Noah they came from Ham uh, Shem and Japheth they came from Noah and Noah came from the lineage of Adam and so we all share this in common common with Adam we share not only our lineage with him, but we share our sin with Adam too. <laughs> uh, so all generations come from Adam and Eve. The man was given the commandment regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now here is my opinion. My opinion is the woman knew about the commandments because she and, she and Adam were at one time one gender before they were created male and female. Another opinion is that the man told um, the, the man told the woman uh, what the commandments were. So he was given the authority to tell the woman. The woman may have known about the commandment uh, because she and Adam were one at one time before they were split into the man and the woman, and then the other, the other, um, the other idea is that is that um, after they were created, after they were separated into man and woman, that the man had the responsibility and authority over the woman, and that he told the woman about the commandment. Um, the the idea here is also that the man is seen as the stronger of the two and the serpent absurds 
the man's authority by going to the woman who is alone. So it is this hope that Hasatan, the serpent, uh, he hopes to, to, uh, to go into the back door, if you will, by going around the man's authority and going to the weaker part of, of, um, of him, which is the woman. By going through the woman, he can get to the man. Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest, fr mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So this man, the man, was entrusted with being the keeper of God's commandment. And what was God's commandment? He says that if you eat of it, thou shall die. In that same day, you shall die. And so, um, it is very interesting that, remember we were talking about how man was created on the sixth day? Well, because God said that the day you eat of this forbidden fruit, to, that is the day you shall die. Well, we look in scripture and it says, that a day, um, a day to God is like a thousand years to us. So if we look at the sixth day and we equate that to thousands of years, we can uh, as assume that it means that we have been here on the earth for 6,000 years. So we are quickly approaching the end of the sixth day and we're going to soon embark upon the seventh day and in another teaching we teach about what the seventh day is and so you can pretty much guess what the seventh day is it is the Sabbath day so um, in the six days of creation on the sixth day God created the man and so we are on that sixth day right now so this six thousandth year is the day of man so at the end of this sixth day man will die and that there will be judgment. When man was created, he created both male and female. The man was one creation, but was later split into two genders. We look at Genesis 1.27 again. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So uh, here we see again that man was once male and female but in Genesis 2.22, it says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So the woman is taken out of the man. Possibly uh, his womb is removed from him to create the woman, thus being called woman. So we look about how God, man and God walk together at once. They walk together in the garden. Genesis 2.8 proves this. And Yahweh planted a garden, it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So in this um, scripture, we see that the garden was separated from the rest of the earth, because it says Yahweh planted a garden eastward in Eden, and, and God created the garden for man to live in, and to fellowship with him in the garden. And so, in our salvation quest, it is our desire to get back to this fellowship, to get back to the place of fellowshipping with God in the garden once again. But the garden had a test for him. The garden had the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The, 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 the test that God put to man to see if he would actually obey his commandments obey his commandment, rather, to, uh, to not eat of this tree. But man failed the test, and because he, he not only failed the test, but he incurred upon him the great rush of all knowledge all at one time, the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil all at one time, and man wasn't mature enough to be able to decipher through all, all of that knowledge. So now we we have been um, flooded 
because we've been flooded with all this knowledge, we are also flooded with sin as well. Um, so the, the, this, this tree, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it tests man's obedience to God, which he fails. Man is warned not to transgress against the tree, for when he transgresses against the tree, he also transgresses against God. Uh, so Hasatan despises man's relationship with the Creator. He despises him so much that he wants to break up what this relationship that God and the man have. They want to break that up. And so Hasatan enters the scene to challenge God's authority and to challenge his creation, to challenge the relationship with the creation. Hasatan doesn't directly challenge the man, but he challenges the woman. The woman is like the back door to transgressing the man. So if he sees that the, the effort to uh, tempt the man is too great, then he will go to the weaker vessel, which is the woman. The woman's the back door to getting to the man. So if you can get the woman to sin and the woman can get the man to sin because of their relationship, then Hasatan has, has destroyed the relationship between man and God. So in the great temptation um, about about Hasatan and the woman, we find that the woman is alone. How many times do we see that, um, that there are a safety in numbers, that when, we are, then when people are attacked, oftentimes they are attacked alone. And so when you attack someone who's alone, they're more defenseless, they're more vulnerable. And this is what Hasatan does. He, he absorbs man's authority by not only by not only going going to Hava but he also goes to her when she's all by herself so that she can be tempted and she can be tested and so uh, the woman already knows the command and so the woman willfully transgresses God's commandment not to take of this fruit Hasatan at this time lies about God. How does he lie about God? He says, you shall not surely die. And that is a lie because God promised the man that if you eat of this fruit, you will die. It's both a physical death and a spiritual death at the same time. And so when Hasatan lies to him, he causes the man to not only physically die, but now he's spiritually dead now. Uh, and sin has been brought into the world to bring death to the man. Hasatan promises the woman that she will be like God. This is another lie, is that Hasatan promises the woman that if you eat of it, you will be like God. And um, Genesis 3.5 shows this. It says, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what Hasatan is doing here is several things. One, he says that he's promising the woman that if she eats of the fruit, her eyes will be opened. And her eyes were opened. They were aware to all of the knowledge. And the second lie in the statement is that you will be as gods knowing good and evil. That was a lie. There's only one God. But he, he promises this to the woman. It is the, it is the lure to the woman. Why w the, the Hasatan, the great deceiver, has to promise the woman something in order to disobey God. He has to promise her something so great that she'll forget about obeying God. And that promise is that if you take of this knot of this tree, you will be as gods and you will have all this knowledge. That is the tempting factor here. The first mistake was that the woman 
listens to the great deceiver instead of drawing near to the creator. So that is how sin works. Sin causes us to listen to a deception, to listen to a lie, to listen to the, the, the promising lies and listen to the deception. Instead of, instead of doing that, what we should be doing is drawing close to Yahweh and drawing close to Him and submitting ourselves to Him and not listening to the lies. But, ha but Hava didn't do this. She didn't resist Hasatan, nor did she deny his words. At this time, she had a great opportunity to say, no, that is not what God told us. She should have said, this is what God uh, promised me. This is what God says. She should have resisted the, um, the deceiver, resisted her, resisted him with the word of God, what was promised. And she should have said, God did say, that if we ate from this knowledge of good and evil, we would die this day. The temptation began in the heart and then progressed to the physical act of lawlessness. And that is how sin works in our lives as well, is that we don't just sin without having the temptation first and it's starting in the heart first. All sin starts within the heart and then it becomes manifested into a physical act of lawlessness, sin. The more the woman looked upon the tree, the more her heart grew apart from God. So that's what also happens with us. Our relationship with God is disrupted when, when we start to grow the temptation within our hearts and our hearts become more filled with the lawlessness, it becomes more filled with the temptation, it becomes more filled with, with the idea of drawing away from God, and the more we, we center on the temptation, the more we draw away from God himself. And the woman saw that the tree was good because for pleasure and wisdom, and that's how sin works with us as well, is that sin becomes pleasurable. And we like the ideas of sin because they seem good to us. So the woman saw that the tree was good for pleasure and for wisdom. Hasatan, if you look in the scriptures, it, Hasatan didn't tempt the man and the woman together, but he tempted her when she was alone. So sin often catches us when we are vulnerable and when we are alone. The man, in turn, he heeded the voice of his wife. So Hasatan used the relationship that God created for the man. Remember, woman was created to be a helpmate for the man. So Hasatan used that relationship that God created and turned it into a weapon against the man. So. Because the, man, the woman was created as a helpmate for the, the woman, the woman operated in that role in tempting the man with what she was tempted with. So the man heeded the voice of his wife, and Hasatan didn't tempt the man. He only tempted the woman. And this all happened because man gave up his authority. God gave man an authority over the creation. He gave it up to listen to the lie of the deceiver. The eyes of the man and the woman were opened at this time when they rebelled against God and they ate of the forbidden fruit. Man's knowledge and technology was probably at its highest at the fall of man and at its lowest at the end of the sixth day which we are in right now. We are fastly, I mean we're at the midnight hour of the sixth day. So that's um, when we have the um, the lowest amount of technology um, is right now. And you might say, wow, we have a lot of technology today. But that, that doesn't shine a, can a candle to what we had in the very beginning. When we had a big rush of knowledge, man had all this knowledge all at one time at the beginning of his existence. Man's history is, like I've said before, six days long 
and then the rest of the millennium. And so the millennium is the Sabbath day, the seventh day of creation. So man was created on the sixth day and we are at the sixth day right now. This is the this is the era or the age of man because he is created on the sixth day. And so this is we're fastly approaching the end of the six thousandth day. Uh, man may have possibly been flooded with all of the spectrum of knowledge at once. That could be, account for why he was so overwhelmed with the sin. Um, because he had all the knowledge given to him all at once by eating of the fruit. And um, so he didn't have the maturity to be able to, uh, to be able to handle all that knowledge. And so he had all that knowledge all at the beginning of time. So um, man's knowledge has decreased over the last 6,000 years. Um, and here's another speculation is that uh, a lot of people tend to think of the fruit of the tree as being an apple. Don't really know why that is. But if we take a look at, um, at another fruit that it could have been, it could have possibly been the fig. And the reason why is we a look at Genesis 3, 7. It says, in the eyes of them were both opened. This was right when they sinned. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So nowhere in the creation account, or the account in the garden anyway, that we see any other fruit mentioned except the fig. So um, because they so so they because they were naked, they were aware, they're probably looking for whatever is the closest thing. I would think that's what I would do. I'm, I'm naked. I want to cover myself. So, uh, how do I hide myself? How do I cover my nakedness? Well, I'm going to look for the first things available. Well, they had just partaken of the knowledge of the. They have just partaken from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So, uh, if they had made themselves aprons with fig leaves, it would it would be logical to assume that possibly that fruit was the fig tree. So I think it was probably figs. Genesis 2.17, it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So here is another speculation, is before the fall, Adam depended on God for his knowledge. So, in this, I mean that God gave Adam what he needed to know, thus accounting for the unique and close relationship that they had. So when sin entered the picture, he was flooded, man was flooded with all of this knowledge, and so it drove, it drove a wedge or a chasm between man and God. It separated, the sin separated man, the man from his God, his creator, because sin entered the picture. Sin separated man from God just as sin separates man from God today. So if you're watching this video and you have, you are not walking with God, you have a barrier that's between you and God that needs to be bridged by repenting from this lawlessness, to repenting from this act that we do by not walking in God's commandments. Because we don't walk in God's commandments, we don't have law, and thus we are lawless. So the lawlessness separates us from God, just as lawlessness separated Adam from Yahweh. Because, because Adam, Adam, disobeyed God willingly, he uh, walked in lawlessness, and the lawlessness separated him from God. So, um, before the fall, I believe that Adam probably walked closely with God, and thus depending on, on God for whatever knowledge that God wanted him to have at the time. So, in this um, understanding of knowledge, 
meaning awareness. We have this Hebrew which, word that says de'ath, which means knowledge or awareness. So the man acquired de'ath, knowledge and awareness that caused him to be separated from God. It's not that because God didn't want Adam to have knowledge, but God wanted man to be obedient to him. And because man didn't walk in that obedience, his relationship got severed. Knowledge provided man with good and evil, but didn't, he didn't possess the ability to tame it or to be able to handle it. Genesis 3.11 says, And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Has you, ha, has you, thou eaten of the tree, whereof I have commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now, God is um, all-knowing, right? Um, so he knew the man ate from the tree. What he was trying to get the man to do was to confess his sin, to repent. And that's where salvation comes in for us, is that God knows what our sins are. In fact, he sends his Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins. But God wants to know that we know of the sins and that we face our sins and that we are willing to confess them and to repent. And so uh, my speculation here with, the, with God confronting the man with his sin is that man was self-aware now and he needed God to direct his paths. So he, he, because he acquired all this knowledge, now he has separated himself from God and now he, 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 he had needed God before the fall. He needed God to direct his paths, but now he has no direction now because he has severed his relationship with God. In other words, he has exchanged the truth for a lie. And the lie was that he listened to the lie of the woman who listened to the lie of the deceiver. He had only sin to direct his path, so now he needed to repent and to turn back to God. Knowledge gave the man the knowledge of what he had done. He was naked and he hid himself. So with all that flood of knowledge he had, he not only had knowledge of everything, but he also had the knowledge of, of sin. He felt remorse. He felt ashamed. He felt aware. He felt naked. All these things describe what he was, what he was experiencing is that when he had all this knowledge, he also felt remorse. He felt, I did something that was against the Creator. 